I recently received an email from one of my website subscribers asking how to prepare photos for printing and display. It turned out he'd been using Photoshop Elements, but had now switched to Affinity Photo 2 and needed to prepare some photos to display at his camera club. In this video, I'll look at preparing this image for monitor and projected digital displays. Then in a later video, I'll look at printing the image with Affinity Photo. This image is at a point where I finished my editing and saved it as a master file. As it's a master file, I don't want to change it, so I'll save a new copy to work with. Let's call this PDI for Projected Digital Images. There are several things that we need to do to this image to prepare it for digital display, or it won't look its best. This includes resizing it, converting the colour space, applying sharpening, and exporting it in the required format. For the first step, using a copy of the image, I'll flatten the file to remove the editing layers. I can do this by selecting all my layers in the Layers panel, and then right-clicking on one of the layers. In the pop-up menu, I'll then choose the Merge Selected option. This merges the layers, so we have a single layer now to work with. Next, let's check the dimensions of the image because this is a full-sized image from a Fuji X-T5 and it's going to be far too large for most digital displays. If I select the Document menu and then Resize Document option, we can see it's almost 8000 pixels on the long edge. To achieve the best display, we need to resize the document to suit the monitor or projector we're using. For this example, I've been told the size should be 1600 by 1200 pixels, so we need to downsample this image. Let's enter a value of 1600 in the size dialog for the long edge. Now because the long and short edges are linked, the short edge is automatically calculated when I click it. This linking is controlled by the chain icon between the two fields. If I click it, I break the link, but it's best not to for what we're doing. If you turn it off, you can end up stretching the image when it's resized, and that won't win you any awards in a photo competition. Having resized the long edge to 1600 pixels, we can see the short edge becomes 1031 pixels, which is less than the required 1200 pixels. I'll explain how to deal with this in a moment, but first let's look at the other settings in the dialog. The unit is set to pixels, which is why I was able to enter the required pixel value for the size. If you were resizing this image for say a print, we might change the units to a measurement like inches, centimetres or millimetres. Below this we have the DPI setting. As we're producing an image for display rather than print, we can ignore this. Then, below that, we have the resampling method. You can experiment with the different methods, but I find either of the Lanxos methods work well in most situations. Then at the bottom, we can see the resample option is selected. If this isn't ticked, the resampling method isn't available, and the only way to resize the document then is by changing its resolution. And that won't reduce the number of pixels in the image, which is no help to us as we need the image to be 1600 pixels on the long edge. With everything set in the dialog, click the Resize button to resize the image. Notice the resized image doesn't look much different because it's scaled to fit the screen in Affinity Photo. You can see this in the Navigator panel if I reduce it to 100% magnification. Now let's talk about the height of the image because it isn't the 1200 pixels required for the projector. It could be that the projector is set to fill the display with the image and that could cause it to be cropped on the long edge or even stretched and we don't want either of those. I'm therefore going to resize the canvas that the image sits on to the required dimensions. To do this, click the document menu and then choose the resize canvas option. Next, click the center anchor point so that any changes to the canvas size are spread evenly around all the edges in the image. We can then click the chain icon to break the link between the two size fields. This allows us to enter their sizes independently, which changes the aspect ratio of the document. If I click the size for the short edge, I can now enter 1200 pixels without affecting the long edge. Having done that, I'll click the Resize button to resize the document. Notice this doesn't affect the image, but only the document. 
we then see the transparent area of the document at the top and the bottom of the image. When this is exported as a JPEG, the transparent area will turn white. If you want to have a black background rather than white, you can add a new fill layer to the document. You can do this in the layer menu by selecting the new fill layer option. I can then drag and drop the layer at the bottom of the layer stack in the layers panel. And because this is a fill layer, we can continue to change the color using the color swatch in the toolbar. The next thing that we need to do is set the color space for the document. If I click the document menu and then choose the option Convert Format ICC Profile, I open the Convert dialog. Here we can see this is an RGB 16-bit image and it's using the Profoto RGB color space. Profoto RGB is a huge color space and great for editing, but no display can handle its full range of colors. In fact, many displays can't even reproduce 100% of the much smaller sRGB color space. If you have an ICC profile for your monitor or data projector, you could soft-proof the image using that. But as I don't, I'll convert this document to use the sRGB color space as that's the most universal. We then have a rendering intent dropdown where we can choose how to handle the out of gamut colors. These are the colors in the photo that are outside of my chosen sRGB color space. The two main options that we might use with photography are perceptual and relative. With the relative rendering, the colors outside of sRGB are converted to the nearest sRGB colors. If you have a lot of out of gamut colors in an area, a relative rendering intent could cause colors to bleed into each other. The alternative is perceptual rendering, which moves out of gamut colors into gamut, but also changes the other colors in the photo in proportion. This limits detail loss, but may cause darker images to appear lighter or muddy. For this image, I'll choose perceptual rendering because I want to preserve the relationship between all the colors of the image. Now watch the histogram change when I click the convert button to apply the settings. This reflects the colors changing to fit into the sRGB color space. Despite this, the image still looks good, so I'll save it. My next step is to look at sharpening the image. When we downsized it earlier, we also affected the appearance of sharpness. We need to fix this by applying display sharpening to ensure it looks its best when displayed. Now I could do that using a sharpening layer in Affinity Photo, but I find the Nick Output Sharpener plugin gives the best results. I'll apply this to a new layer, which I can create by duplicating the background layer. I can right click on that and then choose the duplicate option in the menu. Next, I can select the Nick Collection from my filter menu and choose the Output Sharpener. Remember, the Nick Collection is a third-party plugin. You will need to purchase it separately from Affinity Photo if you want to use it. Once I'm in Nick Sharpener Pro, I can choose the type of sharpening to apply in the drop-down. As this is a projected image, I'll choose the Display option. What I like about Nick Sharpener is that I can control the areas that are sharpened very easily. But I can also add structure and local contrast to the image. This is what makes the fine details in the image pop out and gives it a three-dimensional look. I'll share a video later where I explain how to use this. For now, let's apply our sharpening and return to Affinity Photo. We're now ready to export this as an image for projection. The best choice for a projected image is the JPEG format. I can produce this by clicking the File menu and then choosing the Export option. At the top of the Export dialog, is an option to set the file format to JPEG. Then below this, we have several presets we can choose. Here I'm going to use the best quality preset. Although the file size will be quite large, it reduces the risk of JPEG compression interfering with the sharpening. The other thing to notice in the dialog is the advanced section. This is where the color space for the image can be set. As we have already converted this image to sRGB, the option to use the document color space is fine. When I click the export button, we see a dialog where we can name the file and choose its location. The image is then saved and ready for display. Now earlier I used Nick Sharpener Pro to sharpen the image, but I didn't explain how it worked. In this next video, I explain how to use it and it's a good one to watch next. 
Thanks for watching today and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. I'll see you soon for another video.